Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so, just to uh, introduce uh, myself, this so you've got an idea what I look like at the other end of the computer. This is me and my wife and crop uh, daughters after the, the sex semen trial was successful. Um, who am I? Um, uh, Andrew Russell. I, I started milking at the age of 10. Uh, I knew everything about cows at 15, and then the next 30 years and counting realized just how little I knew and uh, relearned a lot of things through that time. I got a degree in animal science at Harper, including a year out in Canada, which gave me an, a, a chance to go and experience some different uh, ways of managing cows. And after graduating, I, I managed the Dee Haven herd at the South Wirral for, for two years. After that, I was lucky enough to be hired by uh, Genus, where I was responsible for buying the bulls. So responsible for the European breeding program, part of Genus ABS, uh, where I got the chance to uh, uh, work with some of the best breeders in the world, uh, bring some fantastic bulls in, uh, into the stud. And, and travel the world talking uh, to, to, uh, to, to farmers all over the world about uh, UK genetics. Uh, and then I got the chance to come home 18 months ago into, into the farm partnership where I uh, milked 400 cows with my stepdad's mum and my sister, uh, and we have 315 followers. Uh, and so hopefully uh, putting some of my uh, uh, knowledge in, into practice. So what we're gonna talk about today is uh, the cow of the future. So we've got to think about uh, when you're making your breeding decisions, what kind of farming operation will you need in five, 10 or 15 years uh, time to be competitive? Um, buying uh, and using semen is, is a long uh, process. It's not like buying a different, uh, 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 working with a different feed company where you can change the milk at the end of the week. The semen you buy today, it's going to be three years until you see that return on investment when they actually come into the herd. That said, it's, it's, it uh, will have a huge impact. Uh, genetics you, you, you bring in uh, is permanent and cumulative. So anything you make, any decision you make, either good or bad, you have to live with the consequences. And that really sets your, 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 uh, your course uh, for what you're going to uh, do in the future. 5, 10, 15 years is only two or three generations of cows. So you have to think about, are you going to be changing your milk contract in that time? Uh, changing how you, you farm, you're going to go from all year round to block carving and making sure that you're future proofing your, your cows uh, to suit that and the milk contract you have today and what you think that might be in the, in the future. So what kind of cow is needed for that? You know, we, uh, at home, we, we've uh, put a relatively new parlour in, it's only four years old. I need it to last as long as the last one did. So it's going to have to last another 30 odd years. So I need to make sure that the cows that I have in the next 30 years are going to fit into that. So if I have cows too big today, um, then I'm going to be in real trouble unless I start to concentrate on that in, in future breeding decisions. Return on investment is important with genetics. Uh, it's calculated that 30 to 50 percent of improved margins uh, through dairy cows is, is a, a result of uh, improved breeding. So all the manage, management that we do, uh, um, feeding and improvements in that side is worth 50 to 70 percent. The rest of it actually comes from improved uh, uh, genetics. So a very important uh, investment for us and one that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about relative to what else we do uh, uh, day in and day out. And, and maybe we should just uh, uh, pay attention to that. But that steering an oil tanker, it comes back to this five, 10 years or, or 15 years plan. What you do today takes a long t time to turn, uh, but when, once you start uh, uh, heading the, the, hopefully the direction you want to go in, uh, that, that, should, that should pay dividends. So what are the components uh, making up your breeding strategy? Well, you think about it three ways. The first bit is, uh, and I talk about this you know, in my previous role and, and today is, is data. How good your data is, how, how well you collect information on farm is essential uh, for helping you measure how well your cows are actually performing and, and making decisions. And also that data then feeds into the AHDB uh, database to give us better information about uh, understanding what's happening in the next generation of, uh, of, of genetics. Genetics indexes are available uh, for bulls. I'll talk about uh, these a bit more in depth later on. There's a suite of traits out there to select for, you know, to, to suit and explore your milk contracts, uh, your health programs, improving health and welfare of your cows, hopefully ease of management. You know, I, I, I talked about working in Canada where, you know, we had 40 cows or three families kept by, by 40 cows. Today, 
400 cows is, is struggling to uh, to keep a couple of families. So it's uh, it's very much about uh, making sure our cows are easy to look after and and profitable. And then confirmation that's changed a lot in my uh, I, ideals of of what I thought a cow should look like. I'm more a believer now in form follows function. If the cow does everything right, she looks like what she looks like. But that said, there are traits within that that you can concentrate on if they're having issues with you on the farm, teat length, width, uh, stature of the cows, all of those bits that you can actually select for. And then here, genetics. You know, we talk about the mating. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the semen that we buy. The other half of the mating is is what you already have on farm. So what strengths have you bred into your herd? What areas do you need to to pay attention to. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the herd genetic report, which is a brilliant way uh, of, of understanding, giving you a, like a snapshot of what you actually have on, on, on the herd and how you can exploit your strengths and, and certainly work on your, on your weaknesses. This is a, a powerful slide, I think, in, in terms of explaining just how valuable uh, uh, genetics is. And if, uh, if we trace back to Right when I was a lad and started milking cows back in the late 80s, we saw a, a strong improvement in, in, in milk. So the, this blue line here is improvements in, in milk production in, in the, uh, in the uh, national herd. So we know that we were, uh, cows were giving more and more milk through the late 80s and early 2000s. But mirroring that in, in virtually the same curve is a, an orange life, a line, which is showing a decay in, in fertility. So our cows are becoming less, less fertile. And we, we worked with our cows. We, we knew that was happening. Unfortunately, we couldn't select for it. We didn't have a fertility index uh, uh, um, to select for. So basically, in effect, what we were doing was designing a cow to be ultra efficient at turning, uh, partitioning all her energy into producing milk and not worrying about having babies. In the mid 2000s, uh, the AHDB launched the fertility index which is a great way, uh, uh, great indication straight away about genetic lines that would improve fertility or, or the ones that were having an adverse effect on, on, on fertility, and which gave us the opportunity to actually select. And then what we started to see were what you call uh, curve bender genetics, so bulls that could improve milk while still uh, improving fertility. And then the studs and the breeders uh, concentrated on that more, and we see the line starting to accelerate again on production. So although those, although those two are antagonistic traits, they're not really correlated, you can actually find the genetic lines that do do both of these. Uh, so to improve our production and improve our fertility, is possible. Now there was a lot of talk about there's no point selecting for fertility because it's low heritability trait. One of the reasons it's low heritable is there's a lot of fluff in the data but if you get good clean data you actually find that that fertility score is, is more valuable than you think and it comes back to that that cumulative and permanent decision you make when you when you buy your semen and the positive impact it can have on, on your uh, the next generation of cows. So Looking at the farm needs, how can we use genetics to improve the cows that, that we actually work with? So efficient production, the key to us uh, hopefully making uh, money. Uh, some of these traits have been around, well, th these traits have been around the longest and we're probably the most comfortable with. So kilos of milk, uh, kilos of fat and protein. Uh, milk contracts uh, vary up and down the country. You're certainly seeing a tendency to move towards a more uh, 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 component based contracts so speak to your milk buyer is that is that the case that they'll continue to to push for that are they happy at how it is or do you see a, a swing or even are you thinking about moving to a different milk contract and how would you exploit that fat and protein percentage is a good way of tweaking those figures Pay attention to what your milk contract actually says. If you if you actually have a look at the our uh, con, uh, constituent contract today, it's not fat and protein percentage per se that, that pays you. It's the actual kilos of fat and protein that you sell that has the biggest impact on your milk price. So although that looks good for pence per litre, in in fact in your actual milk check you might be find it. Yeah, to, um, but, but more emphasis on the actual kilos of solids that that, that you that you select. Increased longevity, that's important for us. Our biggest cost on UK farm is, is replacing heifers, either rearing them ourselves or going out and buying them. So if we can get those cows to live longer and ultimately, I think, empower you to make the decision about when the cow leaves the herd, not 
involuntary pulling. So not because she can't get in calf or because she's always lame or because she always has mastitis, but you, she's leaving the herd because you've got the next generation through. Um, they're more valuable uh, cows for you, for you to sell. Um, so can you breed for that? So lifespan uh, and then calf survival is a new trait. Um, uh, that ability for the uh, calf to survive in that first year uh, of, of life. Improving fertility, we talked about that before. Uh, the fertility index is a great way of, uh, of improving uh, uh, the actual ability of a cow to get back in calf. Certainly doubly important now as more people use things like sex semen. If, we, if we're empowering our cows to be more fertile uh, and we're using more expensive semen, that's, that's certainly something that, that you notice. Improving under health, one of the oldest um, uh, health traits and certainly one of the ones that helps um, us understand that there's actually something in these health traits that actually was working and you definitely saw um, uh, high cell count cows tended to correlate to being sired by high cell count bulls and, and conversely the low cell count uh, that you see tend to be the, the, on, on farm tend to be the ones sired by uh, those improvers. More recently, there's a mastitis index. And I urge you to have a look at that as well, um, because as you know, if you're milking cows at home, you get some cows that have very low cell counts and then flare up with bad mastitis cases. Equally, you get some cows that tick along with a higher than you'd like cell count score and yet never have mastitis scores. And just in the same way, uh, the uh, bulls available on the market can, can be positive or negative on, on, on those traits. They tend to go together, but that's not always the case. So it's worth having a look at both scores. And certainly if you're concentrating on one area, uh, you, you, you can uh, um, sort your bulls uh, uh, as, as, as you need. Um, reducing lateness, that'll be the one trait I'd, I'd like to improve the most at home. Um, historically, we had predictor traits. So foot, foot and leg score and then the locomotion score came along. As we all know, uh, a good uh, a cow that looks like it's got good legs and feet and then walks like a duck isn't, isn't really going to um, help very well. But equally, you can, these are predictor traits. And you know that when you lift the cow's feet up, you can have a cow that looks like she's got great legs and feet and walk really well. And you lift her, her feet and there's, there's all sorts of problems under there. Equally, some cows are, are less pretty, if you like, less uh, um, smooth on the move, uh, but have uh, um, much better uh, 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 legs and feet. And ultimately, what you're looking for is less cases of, of, of lameness. So moving away from predictor traits and actually selecting for re reduced lameness is, is certainly the way to go. Easy carvings. It's not that, you know, in, in my lifetime, we expected to be up with every carving. Uh, these days, you know, 400 cows at home, I, you know, our aim is to get that carving uh, aid rusty. You know, we don't want to use it. We, the moment we put the ropes on the calf, we're impacting the, that cow's ability to reach a true potential in that lactation and ultimately to get back in calf uh, uh, subsequently. Um, so direct and maternal carving needs, so how easily the calf is born herself and then how easily she goes on uh, to have uh, a calf herself, are two traits you can select for. Feed efficiency. Ultimately, the, uh, the golden bullet really for, for any farm. Unfortunately, the dairy cow lags a little bit behind the, the chicken and the pigs. We're, we're not quite as, as advanced in understanding just, just what makes our cows more, more efficient. So the best we've got at the moment to, and, and, until the feed efficiency score arrives is, is a really good uh, way of measuring the size of the cow. We know a cow has to eat around 2% of her body weight every day in dry matter just to stay alive. So if we can work out a way of assessing how big the cow is, and that's what maintenance does, we can then assign a, a value to that and actually start to, to select for it or, or against it as you see fit. And then disease resistance, you know, uh, lifespan, you think about it, lifespan is resistant to death. And all we're doing here is, is tweaking with the other health traits, particular areas. Uh, but disease resistance, um, certainly with the TB advantage, you know, we, we, we farm in Cheshire, so uh, TB is something we talk about a lot, um, and if we can actually breed for improved uh, resistance against this disease, you know, it's, it's, it's a great tool for us to actually be proactive about how we manage uh, our next generation of cows. So a little bit of a cheat sheet. I didn't want to take it for granted that everybody knew what all these traits were. When, when the sales rep uh, arrives on farm showing you uh, a glossy uh, uh, brochure of, of, of bulls and all, all the performance, you know, what when you get down to the nuts and bolts, what do these figures actually mean? 
So we talked about maintenance before, and that's a, a, a figure in kilos that you would expect uh, above or below the average cow. So this, this bull here is plus three, so you'd expect daughters to be three kilos heavier than average. And to give you an idea, if you looked at the top 50% um, of genomic bulls available today, there's a difference within that group of about 50 kilos between the, high, the heaviest bull and the, and the lightest bull in terms of how their, how their daughters would actually uh, perform. And that's just in the top half. There will be more outliers if you looked at the whole population. So there is a big swing in there if, if, if it's certainly something you're looking uh, to improve. Uh, um, uh, a positive means that the, the size will increase. Uh, our target at home is, is, is to reduce the size of our cows. Our cows are plenty big enough already, so we would be tending to look for a, for a good negative in this, in, in this box. Lameness advantage, you look for a positive score there. And think about it, in, in 100 cows, uh, 2.9 uh, fewer cases of mastitis, uh, uh, fewer cases of lameness in, in that group. Somatic cell counts is given as, as a percentage. A negative is a score that you would be looking for. So this at plus 13 would say that the daughters would be 13% uh, higher in their cell count scores. A mastitis, again, think about percents, five more cases in, a, in 100 uh, against the average bull if you use the, this bull here. Calf survival, um, again, percentages of positive is what you're looking for. So nearly 1% more of the daughters would get through that 300, first 365 days of life. So the most expensive part of the rearing uh, process is in that first uh, 365 days. And once you get them through that, we're far, far more confident of them making it into, into the herd. Lifespan score, most people be very comfortable with. Um, it's in percentages of a, of a lactation. So the average cow in the UK lives for three and a half lactations. So minus 0.1 says it would reduce it to 3.4 uh, lactations, but some of the best bulls out there now are up to one. So um, it's promising an extra lactation uh, by using uh, his genetics on your, in your herd. Fertility index, a negative is, is a poor score. What you're looking for is a positive score. Um, every point of fertility index is, is worth about half a day in calving interval. So at home, a minimum that we tend to set is, is double digits. So we would look for a plus 10 and above and uh, knowing that that should reduce our carbon interval by five days. Um, direct carving ease, so certainly something to pay attention for, um, especially if you're buying uh, um, semen for, for your heifers. Uh, zero is average, a, mi a minus score means harder than average, and if you're looking for bulls to use on heifers, I'd recommend looking at plus 0.5 and, and above. That's around a standard deviation, and that's, that's moving you into certainly an easier group of bulls to use. Certainly pay, worth paying attention when you're using sex semen as well. Where we know that heifers are born more easily and 80, 90% of the calves will be female. But remember, if you do use a hard calving bull on your heifers, you know, you will get bull calves. So just bear that in mind when, you, when you're making your decision about which bulls to, uh, to bring in for your, for your heifer group. TB advantage, so it's an advantage, so you're looking for a plus score, so this bull would be poor for TB advantage. Again, think about it in percentages. So uh, um, 2.3 more cases in 100 against an, an average bull. Uh, um, and then we've got udder, feet, and legs, and, and tight merit. Those are um, scores on, on a desirability uh, level, typically set up by the breed society, and it, it's, you know, it's it's important about how much you think about how much effort you want to put into those traits. To, to be honest, at home, we don't even look at these scores anymore. You know, if I, if I wanted to improve feet and legs, it's to improve lameness. So I tend to look at a lameness advantage. Uh, other scores, I, I, we've got good others at home. I, I feel, you know, proud of that. Uh, but equally, if I was going to look at particular traits, it's things like um, too much crease in my cows or or, or teat length. And you, they've got individual linears that you can uh, um, mix and match for the sort of traits to, to, to fit with the, the herd and what you're looking for. So breeding the right cow for your system. So we've got PLI, which most people have heard of, and then SCI and ACI, which, which may be new to some of you. The most important thing for me is this first bit here, is that uh, pound sterling sign which tells us it's a financial value and it's based on UK figures so it's, it's great getting balls in for that from the rest of the world which which promise 
great, I, you know, I'm not picking on any, but, but could breeding worth or could the EBIs or could TPIs or could net merits, but those bulls are, and those indexes are based on uh, um, a system in, in, in the country that, that that figure came from based on a farmer working under those conditions. If you're thinking about yourself, you're looking at the average uh, UK uh, cow, average UK uh, farmer and working under the average UK milk contract. This is a really good starting, uh, like a, uh, a starting point for you to, to start to select uh, which traits to look for. We can book financial values uh, to all of those traits that, that we talked through before. Um, and you could add them all up, but uh, AHDB does that for you, does all the legwork. So it gives you a PLI score, which is that profitable lifetime index. So the improved margin, a net margin you'd expect that cow to, to perform for you on farm over its lifetime against the average daughter. So the top bulls out there are getting up towards £900 against the average. So there's a real uh, um, uh, um, opportunity there for you to improve your margins. Um, the relative weights are reviewed based on an economic model, uh, reviewed uh, every couple of years and, and certainly more uh, uh, more than that, uh, and then uh, the, the last uh, revision was back in August 2018, but then every base change and when things change markedly in the country, those updates are applied. We did know that when PLI was just available for everybody, uh, twice a year we were seeing, so this is looking at a million in inseminations on UK herds, and we're seeing twice a year that breeders were looking at very different sorts of bulls and you can match those up with the spring block calving herd and the autumn block calving herd, which is telling us that they're looking for different traits. You know, PLI is, well, well you can still see they're making improvements in terms of the average PLI score, and they are looking for quite a markedly different cow, uh, at, at which point AHDB went back to the drawing board to make sure that we were responding to those, uh, those uh, customers. So this is the PLI. If you look at PLI against the rest of the world indexes, um, two thirds of our index is, is based on the cost of production, whereas one third is based on production itself, which would be one of the highest weightings, uh, putting the emphasis on those health traits, keeping the cow in the herd for longer. And that's because the cost for us of keeping our cow in, in the herd, keeping them healthy or replacing them is far higher than the rest of the world. That's why there's so much emphasis on those traits. Again, it comes back to reflecting what the average UK farmer is, is trying to do and what makes him profitable. If you look at SEI, um, the, the uh, ratio of, of production reduces because it's far more important that those cows get back in calf every year. It's important that those cows are not too big, uh, you know, both uh, for efficiency and certainly for, for pasture management. It's important that those cows uh, live a long time and even in the uh, um, production emphasis, the uh, weightings for fat and protein percentage is, is higher uh, to reflect that their typical uh, milk buyers. And then ACI, the autumn carbon index, is uh, you can see it's kind of in between the two, and that that typically matches up with what what that farmer is looking for as well. A little less emphasis on on out and out production than PLI. Higher weightings on on fertility and and longevity. Uh, and, and reducing uh, body size, but not as not to the same extent as as would benefit the spring calving herds. So, which system should you use? Well, starts with which system do you which which system do you operate? If you're a spring block calving herd, the guy is there to go. And uh, the important thing to think about is is uh, this is a market that's very comfortable with with crossbreeding. Um, and it's an all breed base, so you don't have to convert between the different breeds to, to see how they compare and contrast when you're making decisions about first which breeds you want to use and secondly um, how, how well relative bulls do within that index. Autumn block, so you don't have to uh, um, uh, convert between different bases, gives you a good starting point and then um, it definitely reflects what the autumn block farmer is looking for. If you're all year round like we are at home, the next question is, do you crossbreed for your breed of choice? Or yes, if you do 
PLI or PLI are both available. Bear in mind, if you crossbreed and you use PLI, that you would have to convert the figures uh, to put them on the same base if you're, if you're looking uh, at, at them. So we use PLI at home, but I still look at ACI because um, I think, you know, as, as I said before, I'm still learning. Uh, if a new uh, breed uh, comes along, and, and does a better job of what I'm trying to do than the Holstein does, then it'd be silly of me to just stick to my guns and saying, well, the Holstein's better, you know, that's the end of the story. So I would uh, definitely look at the ACI to see what else is out, out there and see how they would compare and contrast and would they work and suit better for my system. So if you go onto the AHDB website, it's great because it's un unbiased, there's no uh, studs in there, it's very easy to, to work your way around. Uh, you can break the bulls down into proven or, or genomic bulls. So this is a genomic list. So the available Holstein bulls, 706 uh, results you can see. Um, there's great little uh, toggle buttons that you can um, work it on, on particular traits that you're interested in. What I tend to do is set minimums and maximums for traits that are, are most important uh, for me. So whether it's PLI, certainly at home, it, PLI, and then uh, kilos of solids would be the first two uh, kickers that I put in. The, the more uh, challenging you, you set these standards, the fewer bulls you get. So just, just keep it a little bit more open uh, to begin with. You can soon fine tune it later on, but you don't want to end up with only two bulls or no bulls that are going to uh, suit the sort of uh, traits that you're looking for. Um, whether the bull is available uh, um, and who the bull's available from, you can actually, um, if, you, if you only tend to work with one or, or two companies, it's a good way of, uh, of filtering and also seeing what other studs have got available if you, if you hadn't um, given them, you know, any time before. Uh, it, may, it may throw up some interesting bulls. There's all the management traits uh, there that you can toggle through. Uh, I, again, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great way of uh, looking at all the bulls on the, on the, on the same, uh, same uh, sheet. It also shows you've got sex semen available. If you start to put your mins and maximums in, so 706 uh, bulls, you don't have time to look through all those. Once you put those kickers in and toggles in, you can get it to a much more manageable uh, uh, group of bulls and then start to uh, put your, your, your most important traits as, as your, uh, your next filter. As you said, ACI is an all breed base. So you can see there's 1,258 uh, bulls. Plenty of balls to go at. So again, set your standards. Um, a, you can actually toggle with breeds as well. So that's a good way of um, starting to filter, depending on what sort of cross you're looking for. Again, once you set those toggles uh, to the sort of levels you're looking for, you can get it to a far more uh, manageable result uh, and, and spend a bit more time on the important balls for your, for your uh, search system. If you also go into the breeding block, uh, uh, site on, on AHDB. There's a breeding trait selector, which is a really good way of um, honing in on, on what sort of traits are important to you. I like a little bit of a cheat, if you like, um, and what to put the info into those AHD. So not to get daunted by all that information out there, you can spend a bit more time uh, honing in on what's important. So preparing to purchase semen, assess the herd strengths and weaknesses. How do we go about doing that? But then setting a breeding goal and set priorities and how much semen and of what type uh, do you need to purchase? Now, that's something that, you, you, you know, I grew up in a, what if the, uh, the rep turned up and he had a bull I was interested in, he put some semen into the flax. That's, that's not really the, the best way of negotiating the best price. If you can go um, when the rep arrives and saying, this is how much semen that I need uh, to a good level of accuracy, you've got your best chance of getting your best price rather than running short and you, you know that um, you're, you tend to have to buy at, at list price for, for, for small amounts. So breeding season, uh, semen calculator, again on that breeding blocks, it's quite easy to fill the inf that information in. It's so easy, even I can do it. Um, a way of then starting to uh, see what sex semen and, and then beef straws you need. Uh, to reach the replacement rates you're looking for uh, or, 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 or whatever your um, uh, breeding strategy is. So the herd genetic report, this is a, this is a tool that if you mill record is, and you've not accessed it yet, you know, get, get hold of the, uh, uh, I'll, I'll show you later on how to, how to log in. 
this is the, your GCSE results for your herd, if you like. It's available for you. You've paid for it already. Make sure you're using it and exploiting it to work out what you've got at home. So on your home page, you see um, you can select your herd breed. So if you've got different uh, breeds in there, you can select which herd is important for you. And then you can also sort whether it's on PLI or if you're block carving SCI or, or ACI. You see your herd bro broken down um, from, from your youngest calves up, up to all the young stock and then into the milking herd. Um, what you can actually see is all of those different traits then as well, with the health traits, lifespan, cell counts and so on, and also the, uh, the PTAs for milk, fat, protein and percentages. What you'd expect to see is, is an improvement over time on PLI because your, your youngest animals will tend to be sired by better bulls than your oldest cows. Um, hopefully, if, uh, if, if everything's been going well and your rep's been doing a good job for you. You can actually select um, age groups uh, that you most want to work with it then as well or, or have a look at. The other thing to have a look at is trends. You know, are, are you putting more or less emphasis without even noticing it on, on traits that are more or less important to you? You can also then, if you slide down the screen, there's a really good benchmarking tool which sees, helps you understand where your herd is against the national averages. It's great because it's a bit competition, you know, I, you know, how can I get up to the top? And it's always nice to see that someone's doing the job uh, worse than you are. But it, importantly, what it does show is what the opportunity is there if you selected on these traits to improve it. You know, how good could your herd be in a particular trait that's important to you? So you can see this herd's doing a, a great job in our out and out yield, less so on percentages, but that might absolutely suit your, your mill contract. Um, and, and equally, you can see um, inbreeding or, or fertility index, you can start to say, well, I need to put more emphasis on that in the next uh, tranche of bulls that, that you select. And you can also look at, at the milking herd and compare your young stock against the national herd as well. Um, your young stock report, and, and you can actually click and, and drill down into the detail of, of what these age groups are and the individual cows. Certainly, that young stock report is great, a great way of starting to see, you know, making decisions about what bulls you need in time for when you start to breed breeding your heifers. You can start to sort them on, on, on PLI. You can start to look at the inbreeding. So this is the inbreeding figure of the animal itself. So you can, uh, obviously that will change for the next generation when you're using bulls, but certainly something to, to pay attention to. Um, but just like the bulls that we looked at before, you can actually start to book toggles on, on these uh, uh, um, individual traits. So you can say, I want to book more, you know, I only want to breed my top animals for, for fertility index and the, and the bottom half. I want to breed with to beef or so on and so forth. So you can then start to select these animals out and, and, and put them into your breeding group. And if you have uh, done genomics uh, that, that recognises UK inf information, that will be fed straight into this as well. So you can see straight away the, the advantage it then has in reliability compared to typical parent average. Okay. So there's also an inbreeding check here, which is a, a, a great tool that I've started using my, myself uh, to sort of give me an idea of where we stand, uh, what the herd is doing and, and what that inbreeding will be with my next group of bulls that I'm, I'm thinking uh, about using. It's an easy tool. Um, it's really straightforward um, and very clear and to understand when you get the results back. It can make cows listed in the herd genetic report and young stock and checks against all available bulls quickly, so you can quickly sort which bulls you're thinking about using. The other thing that I really like is you can add any bulls that you've got in your flask, and it will give you inbreeding uh, scores for those as well. Um, if you go on, again, that breeding blocks, there's a, there's a click a link to a, a, a video, which is sort of holds your hand as you, as you work through the, through the system. Uh, it's called Selecting Size and Dams, and if you click on that, it'll, it'll play your uh, YouTube. I, I had to, it sort of held my hand the first time I used it, but once I've done it once or twice, I, I didn't need any more, but it's, it's, it's a good tip to, to, to use it. So how do you sign up to the Herd Genetic Report? What you need um, is, is to supply your email address and your milk recording number, and which uh, milk uh, recording company you work with, your trading name and address, and send those to the breeding.evaluations at ahdb.org.uk. Now you can 
choose to share that information with your uh, potential reps or, or your vets or anybody else uh, that has an interest, maybe consultants, um, if, if you so wish. This is your information. You don't have to share it if you, if, if you don't wish to, but it might help uh, conversations on farm uh, and certainly uh, helps concentrate their mind, uh, the reps mind when they're talking to you about genetics. So think about which economic index applies to your herd. PLI, FCI, ACI, start from there, and only ever use bulls in the top 50% of the appropriate economic index. So if you look at the genomic bulls today, I think I looked last night, there's 740 bulls available. The top half is there's 360 bulls in there. And within that, I said there's a range of 50 kilos of maintenance. There's a, a range of, uh, um, of, of six on, on uh, TB advantage. You know, plenty of, uh, of differences in, in cell counts. And particularly, there's no reason to go into the bottom half of that available list if you're really trying to drive your... Uh, profit margins forward uh, th uh, through the genetics. So then uh, key into your key, key priorities, uh, ensure that the strengths that you want to keep in there are maintained while then starting to concentrate on the ones that you most want to improve. If you try to improve everything, you end up compromising and end up not really making any progress. So think in your mind about the ones that you, the traits uh, and that benchmarking tool is a really good way of highlighting you know, what, what areas could be of, of concern and then start to make your selections from there. And then run all decision for an inbreeding checker, which puts you on the front foot when you start uh, discussing with reps. So do you buy semen or are you being sold semen? Um, I, I, I think as, as I've uh, held these meetings around the country, there's an element of both in, in this and, and both can be used to your advantage. So it's a case of uh, uh, keeping your wits about you. What I suggest is be proactive when the, the rep arrives. They want to know, what, you know, the, the more information you can give them, the better advice they can give you rather than going in, in cold. So state the breeding goal and key priorities of the herd. You'll soon sort, soon sort out the people that aren't really listening to, to what you're trying to do, and you can move on to the, to the next person. Provide cow numbers and the amount of semen you, you, you're, you're looking for. So, you, you know, that's your best opportunity to get in your best price. I like asking the, the, the rep to suggest bulls, uh, again, another a way of, of, of sounding them out, whether they're really listening to what you're trying to do and how much, how much knowledge they have. Um, because it will also, if, if they're really good at their job, um, highlight some bulls that maybe you hadn't considered that would actually suit the sort of breeding goals you're looking for. Um, ask why that suggested bull is right with the herd and verify the data um, before purchase. They might come with a, a hot new bull available that you hadn't necessarily seen on, on a, the AHCB website. Always check then that the bull is independently validated. You know, just because they've got a, a flashy photograph and, and, you know, some great daughter pictures isn't really helping you because the, ultimately you have to live with this decision in the next generation and ultimately generations after that when you put that semen in. So if they haven't got AHDB data, why haven't they? Uh, and, 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 you know, to be honest, I'd ask them to come back when they've got it. Um, data from the herd genetic report, as, as I said before, if, if you give them access to it or, or certainly talk them through the herd genetic report with you, uh, that's, a, that's a good way of, of, of helping you explain where you are and where you're trying to get to. And again, helps them think about the sort of balls they, they would uh, offer you as, as, as part of a deal. Think about the semen you got in the tank. Um, is the semen in the tank fit for purpose? And I mean this think about it uh, not about how good the bull was when you bought the semen you've got to think about how good the bull is uh, is today because ultimately that's the uh, decision you're making if you bought that semen in, in in the back of the cow have your goals changed from when you bought that semen you know have you now gone on to a different mill contract have you uh, moved to uh, an all year round carving where that bull is is not fit for purpose because to be honest it could be cheaper not to use the bull and either sell it on or, or dispose of it in worst case scenario than actually to use that semen in, in your herd. Does the semen fit the key priorities you've been set? You know, have your, your breeding decisions changed so markedly that that bull isn't really relevant anymore? And I suggest as often as you buy semen, keep reviewing those priorities. You know, keep the tank lean. You don't want semen in there for a, for a, for a long time. It's, it's not actually giving it, you know, it's, there's no advantage to it. 
you know, what you're trying to do is get those, either the genetics walking around and making a return for you, or you didn't want to invest in that semen in the first place, better money in the bank. So you said before, you, you're, we talked a lot about half of the mating. The other half is, is from the, the, the girls who've already got a home walking around. So do your current replacements come from your best cows or do your best cows, like they do here, tend to throw your bull calves and your poorest cows are really good at, at, at throwing heifers? You know, how do you go about changing that and skewing it to your advantage? So historically, conventional semen was the way we, we used it. And certainly we're seeing a growth now in, in, in sex semen. So did you get your heifer calves from the better or poorer genetic females? Can we use sex semen on your best females now uh, to get that ne next generation to help accelerate your, your genetic progress? You can start to think about putting your, your bottom end uh, back to beef so you, you don't have to worry about getting females for, from, from those. Again, it has to fit in with your overall breeding strategy. Are you breeding from everything anyway? Or, you know, have you got a market for those beef calves? So all of those things have to come into play, but it's certainly worth uh, worth considering. And considering, consider genomically testing your young stock. I would say that's an upfront investment. So make sure that you're exploiting the information that you get back. You know, just genomically testing for the sake of genomics isn't actually making an, uh, any any return for you. So you've got to then aggressively use that information to get the most out of that investment that you were upfront. I would say that if any of you run a stock bull, the best investment you will ever make on genomics is, is genomically testing your bull, uh, because that will give you an idea of where he stands and maybe make you think again about how much impact you want him to have on the herd or, or more so, and, and then you can make that decision about uh, what to do uh, with it. So know your strengths and weaknesses uh, through your farm data, through your herd genetics, um, use the, the tools available so select that economic index and uh, tailor to your to your herd system and then use that herd genetic report. It's, it's a really good tool to start uh, seeing what you actually have and helps um, clear, focus the mind when you're looking at a glossy brochure about or looking online about the sort of bulls that, that you really need uh, for that next generation of, of animals. Breeding trait selector is a really good uh, cheap way of, again, helping you focus your mind on, on uh, what sort of bulls you should be looking for. And then that annual semen usage calculator is a really good way of streamlining how much semen you actually need. So you're not either going short or, or, or buying too much semen that you then have to make a decision about later on. So keep coming back, keep thinking about it and keep reviewing it. So if you want a more hands-on session, uh, a little bit more personal than uh, someone talking to you down a computer, um, there's uh, Marco and Fern will be uh, running a condensed version of, of the Breeding Box workshop on the 21st of January at the British Cattle Breeders uh, Conference, and there's details to 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 book your place. But um, that's that's me in a in a nutshell talking through that that breeding advice. I I realise I've got a Cheshire accent and I talk very fast, but hopefully that's covered the the main parts. Well done, Andrew. That's brilliant. Thank you. The top tips were great. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll have some uh, we've got some time for questions. Uh, we've had a couple come through. So uh, please give us some even comments or feedback would be brilliant. Just, uh, you know, Andrew's time and just the information that is given. If there's anything that you found particularly useful, uh, just to remind people that it is recorded this evening. It will take a couple of days to get up on the YouTube channel. Um, but in the meantime, this evening, if you want to get going with, say, some of the online tools like the index checker that Andrew was showing um, or any of the different resources like the uh, the fact sheets. Um, I'll send the link out for all of those and there's also quite a few other things that are nice like the podcast um, as well that we've got there and I know that some of our strategic dairy farms have also been involved um, with the Breed for Better campaign so uh, we'll, I'll send all of that information directly for you over email. If you're watching this back as a recording then you'll just need to go to Google, type in AHDB Dairy and go to technical information, breeding and genetics. And then we've got everything um, there together, all of the tools and all of the information. You can have a, a good look through. So what we'll do now, Andrew, now you've um, been able to have a little bit of a breather. We've had a few, um, we've had a few uh, questions come in. So 
first one that we've got from Mark, um, talking about uh, where is mastitis in the selection for bulls? Um, just trying to think now as well. Um, I guess would that be in with our um, our somatic cell count index? Yeah, if you went into the uh, and, and to, the, uh, to be honest, any stud that that you deal with should be able to supply the mastitis uh, figures, and they tend to be grouped in the other health scores, so they'd be close to the um, somatic cell counts. If you go into the AHDB website, you can actually rank them on on the mastitis score. It's right next to uh, somatic cell counts. Um, there is a fair range, you know, that the high genomic bulls. I, I was I, I trying to remember. I think there's a the difference about six or seven percent just in the top half of generic bulls between the best bulls available and and the poorest ones just in the top half if you look at the general population there's 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 far and there's, there's some slightly better than that but not much more but there's some really poor bulls out there so it's certainly worth um having a look at if that's something that you're uh, particularly keen on improving on okay right brilliant thank you and then just got a comment from Rachel, um, who's a vet, and just saying thanks a lot, and just going to put some suggestions into the practice. Um, we've not had any more questions come through, so if we haven't got any more questions from people, um, then I will send all of the information out. And um, and Andrew, I guess just to finish off, if um, if you could say maybe what the best thing would be you think you've done with your farm, you know, if there's one particular thing that you think has made the biggest difference, what do you think it would be? Um, since I've come home, so I uh, that's a good question. Um, I spent 18 years looking at bulls and the, the rest of the world, and I never really sp paid a lot of attention on what was going on at home because I just didn't really have time for it, um, and. So the quickest way that I learned about the herd was the herd genetic report. You know, that was the way uh, of, of getting past all the fluff about what I saw in the cows. And actually, you know, when I'm thinking about breeding, it's, it's what the potential of the breeding is. So what's inside that cow? What, what's the best chance of throwing the best calf from that next generation? So that herd genetic report for me is something I use all the time. It really focuses the mind on what's going well. Or, or more adversely, you know, what, what hasn't been going well and what we need to put a lot more emphasis on. So that would be that would be my key go to point. And that's that really focuses the mind then when you're looking at balls for, for, for selection. Thank you. OK, uh, I've got a couple of questions come through. So um, Mark has asked to the wellness traits in genomic testing add to the selection process. Um, the. This, the, the, the wellness, do you mean that as in the new genomic traits from um, other gene genetic companies, is that? Yeah, I'm not sure on that one. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, yes, it is. Yeah, so they won't be showing up on um, AHCB. AHCB will only be um, uh, showing the genomic scores that are you know, independently verified that, you know, a lot of the studs will have their own in-house uh, uh, information, which is, which is, you know, good. What you tend to find is that the health traits tend to correlate. So whichever health traits you're using, they tend to, you know, they tend to go together. But that said, there are some other traits out there that are worth looking at. Uh, you know, if, I guess it's having the independent uh, verification of how good that trade will actually be if you use it on farm because we haven't seen them actually working under UK conditions with, you know, with a repeatable uh, um, data. That would be my caveat to using those scores. Okay. All right. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, Rachel's asked if we can um, send out the contact for registering for the herd genetic reports. I'll send that out, Rachel, and um, there's a form on the website. That, um, that you can fill in and get direct access. So I'll send that out afterwards. Um, great, and I think that's it. So no more questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening. And Andrew, thanks so much for your time and doing the presentation for us. I hope the rest of um, your last meeting goes well that you've got for the breeding block. Thank you. Um, and make the most of the herd genetic reports um, and the indexes that are available to you. Um, you know, we've got the new autumn carbon index 
and uh, we've got all of the new fact sheets that have been um, that have been written this year by Marco and Fern, which are brilliant as well. So thanks very much, everybody. Uh, have a great evening, and uh, thanks again to Andrew.